Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Melissa Smith, the Assistant Curator of Community Programs, and I'm here with Hanata Azevedo Morea, Assistant Curator of Canadian Art. And although we're meeting in a virtual space, we do want to acknowledge that the land the AGO is on is Mississauga Anishinaabe Territory, Mississauga. It is also governed by a treaty between the Mississauga of the Credit and the Canadian government. Toronto is Mississauga Anishinaabe Territory. It has also been occupied by other Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat Confederacies. And I'm super grateful today to be able to chat with Hanata about the winners of a recent art competition hosted by Diabetes Canada and Sir Frederick Banting, the co-discoverer of insulin, and especially because his birthday is coming up. Um, so just a little bit, I'm going to give you a little bit of a sense of Diabetes Canada, which is a registered national charitable organization that is making the invisible epidemic of diabetes visible and urgent. And they are working towards a world free of the effects of diabetes. And as part of this, in 2021, Diabetes Canada, in partnership with the AGO, hosted a unique art competition. It was called Art of the Matter to engage with community and commemorate the 100th year anniversary of the discovery of insulin. And the impact of diabetes is pretty widespread and complex and Art of the Matter really provided a wonderful opportunity to connect, support and learn from one another while sharing experiences through art. And Renata is gonna to speak to us about Sir Frederick Banting, who is not only a Canadian medical scientist and physician and Nobel laureate, but also an artist in the AGO collection. And uh, he was highly inspired of the group of seven and really started painting Canadian landscapes in the summer of 1920, which was actually just three years before he received the Nobel prize in medicine. And Renata is gonna take us all the way through that. Um, so are you excited, Renata? <laughs> Very excited. Thank you so much for having me here, Melissa. I love the, uh, the opportunity to talk about, about Benti and about some works in our collection that not everyone knows a lot about. It's going to be fun, I think. And I'm actually really excited, too, to show you some of the winners from that art competition. Um, and I'm also going to be sharing a little bit of a blurb that each artist show, um, submitted when they submitted the artwork so we can really hear the, the thoughts behind these creations. So I'm gonna share my screen so that we can see the first place winner. So this is T1D Life by Bryn Monteith. And this is a ceramic piece. And Bryn has to say that it's about bringing awareness to the ongoing daily struggles of a type one diabetic. So most people think that with insulin, diabetes is not a big deal, but that's not the case. It's always with you. There's never a single second of a single day when it isn't a factor. It's a morning conversation with your parents, a lunchtime consideration, an afternoon investigation, a supper time discussion, and an evening annoyance. You have to remember the insulin, needles, test strips, tester, lancing device, and lancet. Of course, you can't forget the sweet starchy food you have to carry at all time in case your levels get too low. It's hard, it's life limiting and friendship limiting. Not everyone understands that being diabetic means there are limits on time and activities. And Bryn really wants people to understand that type one diabetes is not a choice. It's something that you have to take care of and control whether it pleases someone or not. And I think this is a really incredible piece to showcase that. Yeah, it's amazing how it, you know, it re we really feel the weight that this person is carrying on, on, on their back. And uh, we can relate to that even if we don't live with di diabetes. So I think it's a very powerful, very powerful work. I agree. I agree. And I definitely like to how it's also using some of those daily mm -hmm. objects that would be in that experience too. Um, so it's almost like found objects and then the ceramic work too. Well, that's really great. So let's move on to the second piece. So this is the second place winner. It's Beth Croft. And I feel like this is a bit of a collage and Beth shared, I'm very eco-conscious and the amount of waste I create just to stay alive pains me. I started to save some of it, especially, specifically rather my blood test strips with the intention of creating a meaningful artwork. 
I started playing around with them on a piece of black paper, creating different images just for fun. Then I was told about this competition by a friend, so the competition that uh, Beth entered. The uh, brief to illustrate what life is like living with diabetes seemed to be the perfect time to create something more meaningful in relation to diabetes. And that's when the exploding head of test strips came to mind. Friends and family often joke that they are my calling card as they sometimes find them in places when I visited. This artwork is a culmination of all those things. Yeah, I think it's a beautiful and incredible work to, um, I don't know, just the, the mental charge, literally. And, you know, um, w together with the physical charge, of course, but I think it's a very um, representative, symbolic, and, and we can see the performance of the mental charge really into place here. So um, I love this work. Yeah, yeah, it's so expressive and the movement too, like it makes it feel as though it's a lived experience as well for me in a certain way. Um, and the contrast between the black and the white. Yeah, it's, it's very powerful. All right, and we'll go on to the third place winner, Tiffany Wittig. So this is all about perseverance for Tiffany. Um, I've worked in the diabetes industry for eight years now and see patients all the time who make steps in their everyday life to either help patients or themselves live a better life with diabetes. I can only imagine that it feels like sometimes nothing is moving forward. It is exhausting and repetitive. It can feel like it takes all the energy in the world to rise and continue on. I'm continually reminded of the courage it takes to keep going no matter how small the step is. Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes it's a quiet voice at the end of the day telling you to try again. This piece that I've created called Rise is all about the little steps and the positive mental choice, choices people take every day to rise again. I wish that people would show more kindness to others with diabetes as they're dealing with everyday struggles. Many people think that diabetes can be fixed by changing one lifestyle choice, but what they don't realize is that it takes hard work and a strong state of mind to wake up every day and make little choices all the time. And that is why it's important that we stand by patients with diabetes and show our support rather than judging from afar. That's really special too. And this is, I think, interesting in that it's showing um, experience from the perspective of someone who is caring for folks who identify as having it, diabetes too. Exactly. And uh, it's so wonderful the way um, she can, you know, express in such a colorful brightful, positive, hopeful way, um, the, uh, that, that hard experience, I mean, of being reminded of the, the small steps that you have to take every day to take care of yourself uh, when, you have, when you have diabetes. So I don't know, this is, this is a very moving work for me. the application of the paint like the paint strokes as being individuals coming up and rising up to the day it's it's actually really totally. really beautiful so yeah I'm going to stop sharing for a second because we really did want to just showcase those incredible winners from the competition um and it's also really interesting because we at least I didn't know that Frederick Fantine was also an artist and that his work is in our collection exactly and I was not sure that he was the person who invented insulin. I knew him as an artist, so we had a weird complimentary uh, parts of his personality. <laughs> yeah. One person is so much, right? One person can be so many things. So I think Benty is, uh, is a, one example of, of that. For sure, for sure. And so you're gonna tell us all about him too, which is exciting so that we have a better knowledge of <laughs> him as a person and an artist and a scientist. Yeah, so, so Sir Frederick Grant Benty was born you know, in 1891. And uh, what is interesting about him is that he has always been a very artistic person, interested in experimenting different kinds of practices and media. Um, when, he, when he was a teenager, he became interested in pyrography, which is the art of uh, burning images into wood using a heated tool. So he explored that um, and he began 
painting watercolors in 1920 to pass the time actually while waiting for patients. So after his scientific success, painting apparently became, became kind of an escape for him because it was a lot to handle. Um, and, you know, even though he was making incredible discoveries, there's always um, pressure and, and some burden that comes with that. So he, um, it was his way of expressing, continue expressing his creativity and, um, you know, relaxing. So uh, Benting graduated from med school in 1916 at the University of Toronto, uh, which he had interrupted to serve con the Canadian medical, medical corps in Europe during the, during the war, the World War I. So after he graduated, he went back to the medical corps, trained overseas, and went to France, where he was wounded in 1918. On his return to Canada, he became uh, an intern at, in surgery at the Hospital for Sick Children here in Toronto. So it was after moving, really, to work in London, Ontario in 1921 that his interest, his real interest in painting began. Right? So around, around this period of his life, he could spend hours trying to copy pictures of old magazines and books that he would find uh, in stores and in uh, on windows, and then he would just buy to try to, to, to try to copy them, right? Yeah. Um, in 1925, so after having returned to Toronto, he put up his first exhibition at the Hart House Sketch Club here in Toronto and would soon be connected to Lauren Harris um, and Alexander Young Jackson, who's mostly known as A.I. Jackson. And the person who put them in contact was Benton's eye doctor, who was a group of seven patron. So all these crazy connections <laughs> bring, bringing people together, right? So, um, so as, as everyone probably knows, Lauren Harris, Ava Jackson are part of the famous group of seven, which is you know, the, the group of most famous um, Canadian landscape painting, painters in the beginning of the century, last century. Um, so, what happened was that Bain team visited A.Y. Jackson to purchase a war painting, and then they became friends because they had a lot in common. Uh, one of the reasons they bonded, I think, was that A.Y. Jackson served as a war artist during the First World War. So, and also they had coincidences in their lives. Um, they both got injured in France and they both went to hospitals in England to recover. And they were both very patriotic and shared this interest in depicting Canadian landscapes as well as they could, creating uh, a real Canadian artistic identity and the special for rugged Canadian landscapes. So um, they, they, they became real, really, really close friends. Um, so Benty made his first sketching trip with A.Y. Jackson to the south shore of the St. Lawrence River in 1927. And then they went to other towns, including St. Fidel on the North Shore. And um, later in that same year, they went to the Arctic together. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that when we talk about their, when we talk about Benson's um, paintings in the collections, in the collection. So um, in that, in those trips that they that they did together, um, they sketched a lot, and many of Benton's paintings uh, remain untitled. So, um, what happens when paintings are untitled is that further along, curators or the states or the collectors title those paintings um, after the suggest titles after um, after the artist is no longer there, so that they can be most easily uh, recognized. So. You know, um, A.Y. Jackson and Benting, they painted at the Great Slave Lake, at Georgian Bay, at the French River, Sudbury districts. They went all around. Um, and Benting once told Jackson um, when he was, that when he was 50, so then when he finally got to the age of 50, he would leave research to the young scientists and take up painting full time. So that was his dream. He really wanted to be an artist too, as well as a scientist. 
Um, but he had a lot of work to do as a scientist. So he was going to leave that for a project after, after, the, uh, after he retired, let's say. Uh, but at age 50, while he was again serving with the medical corps, this time on the Second World War, he was killed in an air crash in Newfoundland in 1941. So um, this project did not get accomplished as he wanted, but his paintings were later hung at the Academy of Medicine. They're part of the AGO, Queen's University, and a lot of other um, public institutions all around Canada. Um, yeah, so perhaps we can share the first painting now, Melissa. Great, so um, we can see here, this is um, Big Quebec from 1927. So this was a paint, this was, this painting was done and when they traveled, so A.Y. Jackson and Benty went on their first trip together. Um, they went to Quebec and they went to the big national park in Quebec in March, right? As we see, which we can clearly see in the painting, um, and A.Y. Jackson, he was from Quebec. He was born in Montreal. So even if he moved to Toronto after a while to join the group of seven, um, he knew this region very well. It was his home. So he um, brought Benton together to explore these landscapes in Quebec. We can see some impressionist techniques in the brushwork, if we pay attention, which was, you know, a, a, one of the, uh, the techniques of the Google, you know, appreciated by the Google 7 with shorter and broken brush strokes that don't focus necessarily on form, but on the effects of the light. And we can see the light, the reflections on the snow, um, even if we can see by the painting that this was probably not a sunny day. Okay? So um, we can see that he was a very focused and attentive observer. And when we get to analyze later works by Bentin, we can see a clear evolution of these techniques. And he really um, worked a lot on becoming the best painter he could get. So we can, we can show the next slide right now. Right. So this second work depicts a landscape in Ellesmere Island, which is Canada's largest island situated in Nunavut in the Arctic, very close to, to Greenland, right? So this work was made in a second trip that A.Y. Jackson and Benton took that same year, but in the summer. So um, they went on a Canadian government supply ship, which was really how Canadian painters at the time um, especially from the group of seven, um, succeeded in going to very inhospitable regions um, in the northern, northern Canada, right? So it was usually through government, um, government ships. So the trip lasted for 52 days, and these days were spent sketching almost full time. Um, Benton and A. Jackson, um, worked together, they painted together, they sketched outside, and they came back indoors to finalize the paintings. And A.Y. Jackson was a close mentor to Benting and gave him daily feedbacks on the evolution of, of his work. So even if it was a very tough weather, um, we can imagine, right? Um, Benting really enjoyed the outdoor painting experience. He invented actually a system or getting you know, his completed sketches home without spoiling them while they were still wet. So he placed actually matchsticks between the panels as spacers, which was a trick that A.Y. Jackson and eventually the, the rest of the group of seven used for the rest of their career. So that's a, that's a, huge, con that's a huge contribution, right? Um, and, an interesting fact, too, is that A.Y. Jackson and Benting, they continued to travel to sketch together throughout many years and um, sometimes accompanied by some other artists until their last trip that was in 1937. Um, A.Y. Jackson, they became so close that A.Y. Jackson even published a book called Benting as an Artist in 1948. So after Benting had already passed away. 
Um, and I, I think that's something that's interesting to, uh, to know is that even if Benti, you know, had some of the most talented um, possible mentors and he was a very accomplished artist during his, his life too, um, when it comes to being an artist, Benti suffered a little bit from imposter syndrome, which is something that many of us can relate to. So his works were accepted in, you know, juried exhibitions, were selected for exhibitions, but he was always afraid that they had only been accepted because of his reputation as a scientist rather than his own marriage. So the story tells that he, after a time, even did chose not to submit works for exhibition, for exhibition uh, anymore because he was very conflicted that people were if people were valuing his art or just, you know, uh, giving him a spot because of his recognition as a scientist. He was also reluctant to sell his paintings, always recommending that interested buyer would acquire works from other local artists. <laughs> um, yeah, so he was, a, he was a humble person as an artist, but a very, very devoted, very, very, very devoted to his practice, uh, which is something that he had in common with being a, scient a scientist and an artist, right? Very committed to both works. And so yeah. Care, showing care in a really interesting way too, like the care for other artists and, yes. <laughs> and the work itself. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's so interesting. And it's, I was so surprised to learn that we had works of his in our collection too. So I love that we've come together today where you really had this knowledge of him as an artist. I was more on the scientist side. And I actually think that's such a great way to end when we think about that work, you know, and when we, because can you actually take those two things apart? And maybe they actually inform each other in a really wonderful way. Um, just like our winners who depicted their experience um, and then were able to create creative representations of that. Yeah, I think that art is such a great, uh, you know, way to express your lived experience, right? And um, the three artists that we, whose work we, we met today and who so wonderfully are able to transmit their experience to even people who don't know what they've lived, don't have that lived experience of living with diabetes. Um, in the same case as, you know, Benting um, just joined his two passions and did art with science and, and all of that. Um, I think that sometimes we have a natural tendency to separate stuff and to put them in different cases when all that art does is, you know, be, be informed by life. And they're not that separated. <laughs> it's so great. I love that. Thinking about that coming together, seeing other perspectives. And that's really the power of art. And I think also it was such a great moment today to be able to talk about really relevant things and remembering uh, the work that Diabetes Canada does, the work that uh, Frederick Banting did to support the discovery of insulin. So kind of a good melding today. And I'm sure I speak for both of us when I say that we hope you really enjoyed this moment. Um, and we really encourage you to come back for other close looking series where we dive a little bit more deeply into some of the artwork and programs that we run here at the gallery. And thank you for being with me here today, Hanetta. Thank you so much for having me, Melissa. It was a blast. <laughs> All right, take care everyone.